And welcome back to Your Region at 120. I am Jeff Clark, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student of computer science at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be talking about probably one of the most important philosophers in history. That would be Socrates. So we have about three sources of information that I'm aware of, at least, uh, about Socrates and who he was. Uh, and we can know from the three of them that he was certainly uh, a brilliant guy, uh, influenced at least some of the more important people in history. Um, but we have kind of these three different views of him that kind of we can look at. Uh, the first is uh, from, if I'm uh, pronouncing this right, uh, Aristocles, or Plato, uh, and because he kind of used Socrates as one of his kind of straw men, probably his biggest straw man, in defining what important ideas he wanted to define. And Socrates was kind of like his most important person for describing what is virtue, uh, how to come across virtue, uh, and kind of getting across the ideas that he was probably mostly taught by Socrates himself, but Plato may have had a good couple on his own that he kind of spoke through this wise man who knew more than all other people of his day. Although he would never have admitted that, of course. Um, and the other is, like him, name here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Aristophanes uh, was a comedian, and he wrote a play about, among other things, uh, Socrates being this philosopher with his kind of head literally in the clouds. But Aristocles argued otherwise, that Socrates was a practical man who had a conviction about the way that things could be because he was kind of sick of dealing with uh, practical things not working out okay. So, uh, in general, though, uh, we have these three infer sources of information. The third is, of course, Diogenes of Sinop, or of the Cosmopolitans, uh, as described in the Diogenes video. Uh, and he kind of had different ideas about who Socrates was compared to Aristocles. Uh, in, in terms of, he wasn't as much of uh, a, I guess, theoretical thinker, so much as a, uh, he lived according to his principles. And he really, although he didn't write anything, he may not have even known how to write, uh, he was certainly uh, capable of living in a virtuous way and describing to others how to live in that way, and describing to others how it was that they were living wrong, and he was willing to do so. He was willing not to necessarily point out to, to other people that they were living wrong, but when other people challenged him in the way that he was living, he was able to defend himself by usually making the contradictions inherent in their life visible. So we, 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 we kind of have a lot to, to cover, a lot of things that he kind of came across and thought about. But kind of the first, to right off the bat, quote, but why should we dispute about names when we have realities of such importance to consider, unquote. So here's, like right off the bat, a lot of people were kind of discussing about the best names to call their god, or the best, you know, description of how wonderful they are, or the best description of how wonderful this, you know, king or whatever it is. And he would describe, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what we call them. We can call them a, you know, chicken soup, as long as when we describe things in a certain way, that our definitions are consistent with each other, and that our definitions are clear about what we and that regardless of what you words or symbols ends up being used, we want to discuss and discover the laws that govern the universe, maybe the Plato's forms, uh, maybe the, the, the kind of important things that kind of sit in the background, the, the, the science that's waiting to be discovered. Why waste our time with words? Words are, we, we can use numbers in place of words, going back to the numbers we know. We, we can do all sorts of things, but all that's important is that we discuss the, the deep questions that perplex the minds of men. That is what we want to do. We want to work on the things that can make the world a better place. We're designing the, the republic, the government that Aristocles wanted to discover or design. Uh, the, the idea of virtue and what it is and what it means to live a good life. These are things that if we merely spend our time on puns on Facebook and on cat pictures and uh, proverbs that only concern the structure of language, then we are not accomplishing what it is we could accomplish with our lives 
with our time and effort. These are the things that we should be spending our time doing. Solving the big problems, as Richard Hamming would have called them, uh, or, or at least the things that we should be working on. That is what Socrates would have much preferred us to discuss and to be focusing on. And he had a method of doing so, which is unfortunately difficult to kind of demonstrate over this particular media. But it would involve asking the student a question. And then if the student provides an answer, to continue to ask that student question, but with an intent of nudging him in a certain direction with every answer and every question, so that the student develops an idea on their own, so that the student can come up with the idea seemingly on their own, although the questions certainly help them get there. And it's kind of hard to describe without going into some of Aristocles' written accounts of this, which may or may not have actually transpired, but certainly something like them obviously had, that, that Socrates was willing to engage people at any point, in any part of his life, and always kind of nudge them in a certain direction through question. To this day, if you go to law school, apparently they will still teach you in this manner, because it's a, a way to get your mind, especially on complicated matters of law, and where definitions have to be absolutely understood, and yet the definitions have to be clear enough to be persuasive in front of the judge and in front of the lay public. These are the ways in which the ideas and definitions are taught, not because words have certain definitions on their own, but because of the relationships between those definitions and the meaning behind them, and the things that society needs in order to function and to thrive and survive. This is what Socrates would have taught, this approach to education, this approach to learning that is done with questions and questioning. Of course, Aristocles would have taken that and viewed it in terms of the only knowledge, in terms of these question-answer uh, kind of and reflection upon them is considered knowledge, and that experiment itself isn't worth doing because of it. Of course, that's too extreme. Uh, Diogenes uh, had a different perspective on this, and the kind of challenge that other people, or the, the, the challenge that you can pose to other people by doing so. Uh, but we don't have to follow that directly. All, but we can be wary that there are different ways of educating kids and students than merely having one person in front of a room full of people, or possibly one person in front of a video camera, talking without interacting with them. Socrates showed us that there is a better, or at least a different way, that can sometimes be employed, and might be useful to teaching people to approach some problems that are, as of yet, unsolved. Go back to the different approaches that you And he was interested in solving problems, but he was also interested in cultivating character. And cultivating virtue is something in, worth doing in and of itself. And that, that virtue is knowledge, and that if we can only be aware of what it would mean for us to act in a certain way, we would do so. If we could only be aware of the, the necessity of how, how important it is to know the facts about the universe, the way the universe is structured, and the way that we ourselves are structured, that that could guide our behavior into better outcomes than we could if we only lived in ignorance, whether or not we knew we were ignorant. Quote, is not the discovery of things as they truly are a common good to man all mankind? Unquote. So this is the, you know, the, the, the perspective here, the attempt to discover nature, the laws that govern nature, whether they are driven by the gods or not, to discover them, to not live in ignorance, to not live an unexamined life. The unexamined life is not worth living, quote unquote. That is the perspective, the approach, the way of looking at what life is. If you merely take what you're told and never venture out to learn things on your own, your life in his view, is not nearly as worth living as someone who doesn't take that approach. And someone who goes out and tries to learn new things, engages with the universe itself, to travel, to listen to new opinions, new perspectives, and to try to, you know, from all of those things together, discover the way that things are, and again, to consider the way that things could be. Uh, he was also interested in knowing the difference between action and knowledge in, s in terms of uh, whether or not you were a good person by merely acting a certain way. And so there's kind of this fine dividing line where if you knew why you should do a certain action and you acted on that intellect, then you could be a good person. Uh, but if you thought about all of your actions and their implications and were wise, could choose the best fit solution and best decision every time, 
uh, so that in this particular case, regardless of what it was, that the wise person makes the right decision. So that there's these kind of levels of decision making progress, where the first decision is kind of the you kind of make the right decision that's a lucky guess. You, you may or may not be a good person because of it, but again, you're, you're just kind of lucky. The second is to have some knowledge about the, the technical pro aspects of the problem, and you make the right decision based on that. Then the third level is kind of a wisdom level, where you're making right decisions because you're the type of person who makes those right decisions. Now, whether or not this adequately or accurately describes how decision-making works in practice, or intelligence works in practice, it, it seems to be at least a good start towards understanding what it is that makes us valuable as thinkers. You know, if we design a computer that makes the right decisions for us all the time, is that really worth following all the time? Or should we have some degree of control over the, 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 the parts of our universe that we understand and control? All good questions. Uh, among other things, Socrates uh, tried and claimed to be a foreigner in his own city. Uh, to the, and he even went to you know, lengths like uh, learning the uh, dialect and the, the accent of a foreign group so that even people who spoke to him, who he grew up with, would have to speak to him as if he was someone kind of from far away. And that this distance, that this, this kind, of, uh, kind of even vocal distance, kind of distanced himself perceptually and psychologically from the other people in his city. Uh, so he uprooted himself, he moved to another city, uh, cut off all ties and burned his bridges. Uh, he you know, le left his friends behind, not always, or not intentionally, you know, to just get rid of friends, but to make sure that he would be, you know, think of things in a clear way, so that when he was thinking about the city and discussing things about the city, even his own city, that he was as neutral as you know, available at the time, and yet with someone who's kind of trained in the art of looking at things in a clear and distinct way, uh, he was, with, because of this distance, able to see things that other people who grew up in his city uh, would not have seen. Quote, there is in every community things that have, have to remain unsaid, unnamed, unuttered. You signal your belonging to to that community precisely by participating in the general silence. Revealing everything, telling all, is a foreigner's job." Unquote. And so this is, that's from a, a New York Times board, but the, the, the point here is that this, this is someone who is intentionally putting distance between himself and the things that he studies, i.e. the people around him and the governments around him. Also see video number two. Uh, for more about the life worth living. Quote, I run away because I'm afraid that I may fall into a bottomless pit of nonsense and perish. Unquote. So this this is, you know, the, the bottomless pit of nonsense. There's probably a lot of things about that. But, you know, again, this is just someone who's willing to avoid being confused. Willing to, you know, entertain ideas. Uh, but when it comes to being clear of thought, he's willing to take the steps to distance himself from the things that would be confusing or would confuse him. To the point where, or in the direction of being interested in learning who he is, and more importantly, who the people he talks to are. So the question is, who are you? You know, when he asks you, who, you, who are you? Are you the people in your life? Are you your pants? Are you your cargo pants? These are the kinds of questions that you know, would come from a Socratic reason. And they may reveal things about yourself that you may not be at least consciously able to, to see at first and grasp. Uh, I have someone, a friend of mine, Chris, uh, who whenever, uh, you know, someone is getting really serious with, uh, or in a relationship with one of his friends, uh, that the, you know, will we'll ask the, the person that they are in a relationship with uh, 20 questions in this kind of Socratic way. Uh, and usually he finds things about them, even in 20 questions, uh, that, that would be, have great impact on any potential future relationship with them and the friend that he's asking on behalf of. This is exactly the kind of thing that Socrates would have been interested in doing, finding out the nature of a person on a deep level enough that their relationships could be uh, 
that, or that that question could be of impact to their personal relationships, especially long-term ones. Who are you? What kind of relationships are you capable of? Uh, do you match with the person that you are spending, the rest, or potentially spending the rest of your time with? These are the questions that you would have been interested in finding. And then not just for that individual person, of course, but for the entirety of humankind, bringing it to the global scope, or at least to the national scope, and finding what, what kind of government do we actually have? What kind of government should we have? What kind of government is the perfect government? These are questions you can ask, and getting to the details of those questions can get us closer to achieving those things. Quote uh, from Socrates, where is, it, where is deception most likely to occur? Regarding things that are different much, or things that are different litter, or differ little from one another? That is, right, regarding those that differ little. Socrates. At any rate, you are more likely to escape detection as you shift from one thing to its opposite if you proceed in small steps rather than large ones. Failures. Without a doubt. Socrates. Clearly, therefore, the state of being deceived and holding beliefs contrary to what is the case comes upon people by reason of certain similarities. Failures. That is how it happens. Unquote. Failures. So, going back to the slippery slope video, you know, th this is a discussion of the slippery slope. Where there's, you know, from one large thing to another thing, that if you have to discuss the differences between the two, you end up doing so in small steps and like having the the argument proceed in very, you know, small detail by detail. And yet, that is exactly the thing where you would make a mistake one way or another in choosing between. So there's this kind of paradox between your ability to reason clearly and the existence of a slippery slope on that thing that you're reasoning about. Interesting that that is brought up. Uh, faders. Go read it. Go check it out. So, he, he was interested in you know, reasoning and our ability to reason, and our ability to reason clearly, and, our, and was, like Aristocles, was interested in clear definitions and making sure that the student understood the definition at a clear level. He was interested, as kind of described before, that the idea should be born in the student's mind, that the teacher, teacher the teacher should just act as a midwife, unquote. That there's value in having the person you're discussing something to think of something as their idea. I've heard in the early history of computer science in the ENIAC days in the 50s or whatever, that there, most of the people involved happen to be women, but most of the people who were making the decisions happen to be men. And so the women had kind of a two-level uh, difficulty. First of all, they had to come up with the idea that worked, which was, I mean, in the early days of computer science, hard enough. But then the second problem was is they have to actually frame it and discuss with the men the idea in such a way that the men actually could think of it in terms of their own ideas and that they would consider it as their own discovery so that they would then fund whatever the change was or, or make whatever the change was because they wouldn't do it if the women just told them to do it because their ego or whatever was at stake. Uh, and it's unfortunate that that happened, had to happen but that's a a very Socratic way of doing things, that kind of making the, the person that you're talking to think of something as though it was their idea, and then getting them to act on it, because you always act on your own ideas, or at least it's much more likely for you to act on your own ideas than the ideas of someone else, and that's exactly what he would have been interested in doing, and it's why, to this day, you know, go back to the Aristocles video, that's who we remember, we remember his view of love, and, or at least you know, transferred to us through Christianity. You know, this is what his teaching method, the consequences of it was, that the people in his life ended up you know, doing these things, doing these great things. And that is much, much more important than just having him, you know, teach people and then having it forgotten. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah. So, quote, knowledge which is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold on the mind. Unquote. From Socrates, he knew tyranny. He lived, you know, old enough that he saw city-states go from democracies into tyrannies and kingdoms. You know, he, he would have lived long enough to have seen, you know, true barbaricness from uh, or, uh, barbaric cultural practices from, you know, his governments of the day. This is not a theoretical question to him of knowledge being acquired under compulsion. People were, you know, put to death for their knowledge, uh, and he uh, specifically was put to death 
for purposes of knowledge, as we'll discuss in a bit. But he saw this. He, this was not just something that he would have talked about. You know, he knew that if you were told, oh, yeah, the king is great. I love the king. You know, long live the king. You know, you didn't really believe that. You just said it because you knew that you would be killed if you didn't. And that was exactly the kind of thing that was happening around him. So, no, you, you don't want to just force your students to learn. You don't want to force anyone to learn anything because it just doesn't stick. They'll continue to believe what they believe. Yes, you can sometimes get away with a big lie, but by and large, you know, humans are, are versatile in our ability to continue to remember things a long, long after the fact. So there's that. So, as kind of mentioned, he, he was put to uh, He was put on trial uh, for, I can't remember the exact details, it, it's been quite a few years since I read the apology, uh, but it was something like believing in the wrong gods or um, whatever, but whatever the charges were, that wasn't why he was being brought to trial. He was being brought to trial because he was an annoying pain in the ass to the people in his city, because he was asking questions that nobody was asking, because it was politically difficult to answer those questions in such a way that you would get away with it without offending somebody, without causing people to think about themselves in a deep way that was uncomfortable, without causing people to go, Argh! and see themselves in a really bad light. Because, again, we've, we've had thousands of years of looking at governments and thousands of years of understanding who we are uh, from a lot of different perspectives, from the psychological perspective to the Christian perspective to the, you know, the, all, all sorts of different ways of looking at us. Whereas they didn't really have that yet. They were still kind of developing this way of, ways of looking, ways of thinking, ways of reasoning. And so when Socrates started asking these hard questions, it was causing waves. It was causing people to be uncomfortable, to, to think of things in different ways, to approach things in different ways, to start ex maybe even ex you know, experimenting, founding schools as Aristocles did. You know, that there was, he was inspiring people to approach life in a different way and approach life in a distinctly what we would consider a Western way in, in our kind of current times. Western society, to a large extent, is his idea. This world that we have built here in the Western world, this is his world that we have thought about and went, hmm, that's actually a good idea. And we did that. Why? Because it was a good idea. You know, or, or at least there was ideas that were worth doing. Not all of them had, you know, obviously good effects. Uh, the you know, Greek society was a slave society. But he would have pointed you know, problems out with stuff like that. You know, the fact that we were able to get as far as we have a large to a large extent depended on his being able to kind of push the mold and break the boundaries on that. And that made people uncomfortable. So he was put to trial in a bit of a show trial. But he agreed with everything that they charged him with, pretty much. In that he's like, well, like I don't know if he, he agreed with the specific details of you know point by point, but uh, he he more or less said, okay, well yeah, you know, I'm I'm guilty of corrupting your youth if you consider this corrupting youth, or I'm I'm guilty of uh, teaching people and understanding things in a way that's different than you. Yes, and I will accept the consequences, and if those consequences ex include death, then I will follow the law to the letter, and I will happily accept the decision of the court. And everyone was shocked, because no, most people would not do that. Most people, and people even before him, were, were kind of given similar se sentences and similar trials, and the result was to let them escape, and to basically say, okay, well, I'll fight the, the case, but as a consequence, you have to leave, admit that you were wrong, one, two, and leave the city. And uh, he did. He, he said, well, you know, you are right in charging me. You are right in uh, doing all these things, but you do so in ignorance. And you do so, uh, you know, out, out of an unfortunate prejudice or whatever. But, uh, you know, the law is the law. And a world without law is not worth living in. A world that you... You know, don't abide by your decisions and the consequences of your decisions is not worth living in. So I will take the consequences of teaching people and discussing things, and I will, you know, have this death that you give me, which is just as good as any other death that you could give me, or that anyone could give me, or that I could die myself. And this this act, this act of accepting, is not not with resignation, but just as a yes, this is part of my life. I will I will accept this death because this is part of how governments work. And I want to make a point about how governments work in that, yes, they'll sometimes condemn people to death, but they do so because they follow a law, a law that is worth getting right, a law that's worth 
putting some effort into deciding who lives and who dies in such a way that it doesn't just kill people randomly, but it chooses who to die and who to live in the right way. That is what he was trying to get us to do, trying to get us to see that there are decisions that are worth thinking about, that are d decisions worth putting effort into. And killing him, maybe they didn't put enough effort into it, regardless, he, he died, he took the poison that he gave him, he drank it, he drank it in a room full of people that he was willing to talk with until his very last breath. And he was willing to teach, he was willing to, to help attain enlightenment until his very last breath. And so, this is the, the person we are, we are kind of approaching here. The person who's willing to go all the way to his very last breath, teaching others learning from them as going back to the you know the teach video uh, he was able to to interact with some of the smartest people of his time uh, not everyone of course um, as discussed in the uh, Democritus video there were some people who were smart enough to have talked to him but never got the chance but many of them many people did and he inspired many people afterwards uh, Dick, er, and as mentioned Diogenes kind of saw how Socrates lived and saw how his wisdom impacted the world and used it as an example for his life. Uh, and that the important thing was that virtue and knowledge could be taught. It wasn't inherited. It wasn't intrinsic to someone. You could improve someone by showing them the example of how to live, by taking things seriously to the point of death, to the point of everything above you being directed in the aims of living as a good person, living a good life. Um, so Plato considered Diogenes as Socrates gone mad, but it could be entirely possible to view it as the other way around, that Plato was Socrates gone mad, and that his approach to you know, creating this bureaucracy that enforced people to believe in a certain way was also incorrectly using Socrates' ideas. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we, we can we can view him as a wise man. We can we can take the extant writings of him and we can read them. Again, I, I suggested you, that you read Apology in the uh, Aristocles video. You know, go read the you know one of the Aristocles' other works. Go read the Republic. It's a long book, but it's worth thinking about. And even if you get a biased view of what Socrates is about, at least you can get you know, a view of him, a touch, a you know, drop of his mind that has influenced Western civilization to the point of effectively founding. This is the man that started the whole thing rolling. We are all in his debt. If you have any questions about Socrates in his life, uh, I, you know it's been uh, over a decade since I've read most of his, uh, most works relating to him, and I still haven't read the uh, the Clouds and Aristophanes. Or Aristophanes. Uh, so I'll be able to answer some questions, although pro probably not all of them. Uh, but as usual, if you'd like to support this video series, feel free to send bitcoins to this bitcoin address at the bottom here. And uh, hopefully you enjoy. I will see you next video.